this is not a clickbait video. In this video, I am going to make a mirror frame to hang on this wall, and by the end, it will have a market value of over $120,000. Let's begin. I've got this cheap mirror hanging around, gathering dust and feeling totally in love. So the plan is to give it the phoenix-like rebirth. First step is separating this mirror from its sad frame by removing all the covers and staples. The mirror is glued to the frame with some type of adhesive. I tried to scrape and clean it with a knife blade, but I realized that it's not gonna work and the glue should be removed in the exact same way that it was put here in the first place, with heat. I used the heat gun to melt the glue and sure enough it start to melt and loosen up and I can separate the mirror from the frame. Now from here it's all about patience. You cannot rush this process. I was pulling up the mirror very slowly and very gently as the glue was melting. Again, you have to be very careful not to pull very hard otherwise you may break the Shh. Luckily, I've got another one of these babies. After removing the hangers and the cover, again I have to unglue the mirror. Learning from my mistake, I realized that instead of putting pressure on the mirror, it's better to put the pressure on the frame, since it's made of plastic and I don't really care if it breaks. Little by little I separate the frame from the mirror till they are completely separated and voila! Mirror and frame are no longer a pair. And I did not break anything this time. Then I remove any excess glue and try to clean it up as much as I can. I am going to use this slab of red oak to build the frame. Since it does not have a straight edge and it is as wide as a highway during rush hour, I cannot use my jointer. I am going to use my track saw to cut a straight edge and I'll do it in two passes since it is pretty thick. Then I take it to the table saw and rip it into thinner pieces. Using the jointer, I surface and square one face and one edge. Back at the table saw, I rip the boards to their final width and using the planer, I bring the board to their final thickness. Well, that is basically the process of milling. I call it the symphony of jointer, planer and table saw. As you probably understand from my explanation at the beginning of this video, this is not your average mirror. No sir. This mirror has a secret weapon. It has got lights. I need to cut a groove on the face of the frames to accommodate these LED channels. A quick measurement of these channels indicate how wide and deep should my grooves be. I'm going to use a dado stack to cut the grooves. So I stack the blades to match the thickness of the channel. Oh, and shout out to the genius who invented this magnet on a stick thing. I just wanted to say that your efforts have not gone unnoticed in the realm of lost screws and fallen keys. All right, back to the build. After making sure that the blades are set to the correct height, I do a test cut to make sure I have a good fit. And as you can see, the fit is good, so I go ahead and cut the grooves.
Next step is to cut a rabbit on the back side of the board. This is where the mirror and the backboard sit. I don't need a dado blade for that and it can be done with a regular blade. I just need to adjust the height of the blade and cut, adjust the height again, turn the board 90 degrees to the perpendicular side and cut again. Over at the miter saw, I cut the 45 degree miters of all four sides of the frame. The LED light strip that I use has a controller that also connects to Wi-Fi. So before the glue up process, I need to carve out a cozy home for the LED controller. I need to somehow embed this controller into the frame. If only I had a machine that can precisely cut to the width and the depth that I want. Well, as a matter of fact, I do have that machine and I use it to carve the back of the frame to accommodate the controller. I also need to drill a hole from inside of the groove to the back of the frame so I can run the LED light strip through it and connect it to the controller. And one last hole needs to be drilled for the adapter cord. For gluing up the frame, I am using Tight Bond 3. Tight Bond 3 has a longer open time, which gives me more time to easily glue up this big frame. When gluing up big frames with mitered corners, I like to use this strap clamp because it applies even pressure to all four corners at the same time. If you are wondering what I'm doing here, I am cutting slots in the miters for splines. I do not have one of those fancy spline jigs, but even if I did, this frame is too big to fit on a spline jig. With the help of my drum sander, I sand down a piece of walnut to the thickness of my blade, which is eighth of an inch. I use a liberate amount of glue in the slots and on the splines and then insert the spline into the slots. Then I clamp them and let them dry. After they're dried, I use a flush trim bit to clean up the surface. I love using the splines. Not only do they make the miter joint strong, but they also give them a beautiful contrasting look. And now here comes everyone's favorite part, sanding. I sanded only up to 120 grits, uh, cause I'm going to finish it with Rubio Monocoat. And that is the highest grit suggested by the manufacturer. The edges are sharp at this point, I mean, not razor sharp, they are not comfortable to touch. So I use a chamfer bit to put a slight chamfer on both inside and outside edges of the frame. As I mentioned, I'm using Rubio Monocoat for the finish. This is Oil Plus 2C Walnut, which is the same old hard wax with the walnut stain. I mix them in 3 to 1 ratio and I use a maroon pad to spread it and massage it into the wood. After that, I leave it for a couple of minutes and then remove any excess using clean shop towels. Now it's time to watch as these channels find their groove, quite literally. The company that sells these channels also sells these corner connectors. I mean, you don't have to use these connectors since these channels are made of aluminum and you can easily cut them using your miter saw. But it wasn't worth the hassle. These are precisely cut to the same size at 45 degrees. Then 
the length of the channel that I bought are 3.3 feet, which I believe is one meter. There were longer sizes available, which I wish that I had bought them. So I have to cut some short pieces to cover the whole thing. For sticking the LED strips into the channel, I start at the bottom. The head of the strip goes to the back of the frame through the hole that I drilled earlier. And then I measured the length that I need to the first corner and I cut the strip. I could have bent the strip around the corner, but in those tight and sharp corners, that may interfere with the connectivity of the strips, and it is just a recipe for disaster. So instead, I use these corner connectors. Using them is pretty easy. You just insert the heads of your strips into the clips, and two clips get connected with an L-shaped strip. Everything was going alright till I realized that the clips don't fit into the channels. So the best thing that I could do is to cut the caps of the clips and trim the sides so they fit inside the channel. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Most of them fit alright, but just some of them needed some persuasion. I repeated this process for the other corners as well, and as I was going forward, I also installed the cover of the channels to make sure they fit correctly and the LED strip didn't interfere with them. Alright, the front of the frame is done, a quick test to see if everything works, and it does. Now let's turn our focus to the back of the frame. We are almost done, I promise. I dropped the mirror into the frame and the backing board on top of it, then I used these, I believe they call it glazing push points, to hold and secure the mirror and the backing board. They are very easy to use, you just point the pointy end toward the frame and with a flat head screwdriver you just push it into the frame. As simple as that. After that I just need to attach the controller to the frame and connect it to the LED strip. And I do that using double sided tape. And then we are done with the build. I hung it on the wall with a picture hanging wire and then I plugged in the power and there you have it. As I said, these LED lights are smart and you can control them with its app. I can turn it on and off and on again, I can dim it, I can brighten it, I can change the colors, or I can use its predefined effects. Or I can ask Alexa to do it. Alexa, turn on the mirror light. Alexa, turn off the mirror light. All right, I know, I know. You'll be like, hold on, didn't you say it would be worth more than $120,000? Yes, you are correct, but I'm not finished. I have one last thing to do.
Ta-da! There you go. Now it is worth more than $120,000. Waiting for the right buyer to buy it. You'll probably be like, dude, it is not the same. The artist who made that art had a vision and wanted to send a message with his art. Also, you're not an artist. Well, let me be the first one to say that you are absolutely right. It really matters who makes a piece of work. Take this video for example. If Mr. Beast had made this video, it would have gotten millions of views. But because I made it, no one gives a sh**. Alexa, ask everyone to subscribe to my channel. Please subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. Thanks.